Welcome to the Gate Center of the College of the Atlantic. This is our annual presidential lecture, and my name is Darren Collins. I'm the, the president here of the college, and I'm also an, an alumnus from the class of 1992. And tonight we will be treated to a wonderful evening in the presence of Suzanne Folds McCullough. Suzanne holds the Ann Vote Fuller and Marion Titus Searle Chair and Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can ask my wife, Karen. I was practicing that in the shower for the you know, 20 minutes before we started here. Next year will be Suzanne's 40th year with that institution. 40. This relationship with the AIC began in 1975 when Suzanne was still a doctoral student in fine arts at Harvard. And I, I know from personal experience that managing the new job and the doctoral degree at the same time can be very, very tricky. And I'm sure Suzanne's dissertation advisor, Conrad Oberuber, who is the world authority on drawings of Raphael, had more than a few heart-to-heart -heart discussions with the Suzanne as you are trying to do both things. Uh, for de four decades after receiving her degree, Suzanne repeated this massive balancing act when she managed to continue her leadership role at the Art Institute of Chicago, all the while serving as the Ruth and Clarence Kennedy Professor of Renaissance <laughs> Studies at Smith College in 2012 and 2013. So we've seen that Suzanne is more than capable of taking on two big challenges over the, over, at one time. And over the past four decades, this kind of dedication and intellect and passion has helped her become a leading authority and scholar on the old masters who work on paper. And we'll hear about her personal reflections from these roles in her lecture tonight, which she's titled The Private Collector and the Curator. But before we, we go on, I spoke with two people about Suzanne, and those discussions will give you a little bit more flavor of uh, her accomplishments and her ethos. So this spring, the College of the Atlantic was fortunate enough to have Garland Taylor, who is a Chicago-based visiting artist and instructor uh, who is teaching three-dimensional design at the college. And when I told Gar, who is a close friend and colleague of mine, that Suzanne was on our board and coming to speak, he said, well, you know, that's like having a Chicago-based Athena on campus. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked my friend and colleague, Lynn Bolger, who you know is CUA's Dean of Institutional Advancement. I asked her about Suzanne. And when our beloved former chairman of the board, Ed Blair, passed away in 2010, Suzanne hosted Lynn and other College of the Atlantic folks at his service. And that left, I think, a real impression on, on Lynn. And Lynn described Suzanne during those difficult times uh, as warm, generous, thoughtful, and brilliant, four adjectives rarely found in one human being. So without any further delay, welcome Dr. Suzanne Folds McCullough. Uh. Wow. wow, I'm just stunned. Thank I've never had such a nice introduction. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who've made this evening possible. It's such fun for me to be able to share with you something that has meant so much to me for all, all of my career, as you can see. And um, I'm happy to speak about the unusual flourishing of drawing collections in Chicago. This phenomenon has also been... Okay, there we go. Is this better? Can you hear me now? The rather unusual flourishing of drawings collections in Chicago is a phenomenon that has become a passion for me. Over the past decade, I have showcased five collections, two of them twice, producing handsome and scholarly but accessible catalogs, bringing the private realm to the public. Tonight, I'd like to give you a sense of these different collections, each a work of art in its own right, and place them in the larger context of the history of collecting drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago. Let's get some pictures going. First, a word about drawings. One of the most familiar and intimate art forms, we all make them, 
doodling, mapping out ideas, revealing our innermost thoughts simply with pencil or pen on paper. They can be spontaneous sketches or fulsome finished presentation pieces. Their handling and materials reveal their origins. Seldom signed, their authorship is often a matter of debate and what your eye can tell you. They capture the artist at work and can often catch the essence of the artist more directly and less expensively than an oil painting. Not only do I love drawings for what they reveal about the artist, I love them for the response they get from those who choose to live with them. It has been my pleasure over almost 40 years at the Art Institute not only to witness and abet many different collectors as they've built their own collections of drawings, but also to see many of these works come ultimately to the museum as living legacies to the public. In 1911, three Art Institute trustees, Kenneth Sawyer Goodman, Clarence Buckingham, and William McAllen McKee, established the Department of Prints and Drawings, which Goodman and McKee ran initially, and Clarence Buckingham largely formed with his extensive holdings of old master as well as Japanese prints. The prevailing interest in those years was French art, with trustee Martin Ryerson using endowed funds to purchase Odillon Redon's entire printed oeuvre from the artist's widow in 1920. The key role of such charismatic private collectors in the formation of the institution is underscored by the rich legacy of Mrs. Potter Palmer's collection of French Impressionist paintings in her bequest in 1922, including this beloved Degas pastel that you see on the right. The story of complex relations between collectors and curators in Chicago begins with the 1921 contract for almost 4,000 European and American drawings given by William Frank Eugene Gurley in memory of his mother on what would have been her 90th birthday. He wrote, I hope to live to see the time when this collection, as large as it is now, will be almost lost in the greater collection of which this will serve as a nucleus. By the time Gurley died 22 years later, leaving another 6,600 drawings. The museum was actively cultivating the acquisition of major drawn masterpieces. And indeed, this collection was almost lost for another two decades. Visually impaired by measles as a child, Gurley graduated in geology from Cornell, taking a postgraduate European voyage that included seeing an old master's drawing show at the Grosvenor Gallery, London, in the winter of early 1878. A passionate collector of stamps, Indian artifacts, rocks, and fossils, he joined the gold rush in Colorado, was appointed state geologist and director of the Illinois State Museum of Natural History, joined the faculty of the University of Chicago as a professor of geology in 1897, and in 1900 was appointed curator of the paleontology collections of the Walker Museum there. By 1906, he seems to have begun buying drawings from and through Meg's Brothers, London although it is unclear whether he was present at these sales or not. Yet as curator, he deep, deeply cared about the cataloging of his collection, often inscribing ins obscure attributions on the verso of the drawings, unfortunately, in ink. Here are two Barocci drawings um, that come from the Gurley collection in two different s tranches. The drawing on the right of the screen of the swooning virgin was part of the 1922 gift and was recognized early on. But the drawing on the left of the screen is a study for the Madonna di San Giovanni. It's probably his earliest known pastel drawing um, of any sort. It's life size, and um, you can see how it captures the fluttering figure, fingers of the Virgin's hand as she's trying to hold on to the foot of the Christ child. And this was languishing in a box that came in in 1943 after Gurley died, uh, which was marked um, British watercolors. And I was the one that discovered that it was by Barocci and what it was for. So we got two wonderful drawings from Gurley by this fabulous <coughs> Renaissance artist. Now, Curator Cultivates Collections. It was Carl Schneewen, the museum's first professional curator, hired in 1940 from the Brooklyn Museum, who 
who inaugurated the extraordinary tradition of philanthropy for which Chicago has become famous. Enticing Bertha Palmer's daughter-in-law, Pauline Palmer, and Margaret Day Blake to travel with him to New York and abroad, he persuaded them to buy great drawings for the museum directly, creating collections there in their names, foregoing the pleasure of hanging them on their own walls at home. This is a very important trend that started in 1940. They sought signal images in perfect condition, such as Fragonard's beguiling wash study of the letter purchased by Margaret Blake in 1945, or Matisse's Fauve masterpiece of a nude in a folding chair of 1906 that shows Pauline Palmer picking up where her mother-in-law, Bertha Honoré Palmer, left off. Pauline Palmer died in 1956 and Schneewen the following year, but beginning in 1958, his apostle and successor, Harold Joachim, my mentor, continued and expanded that tradition of extraordinary philanthropy, working with Margaret Day Blake for another two decades. Celebrated in, in an exhibition in 1970 as an example of what an individual can accomplish on behalf of a museum, Margaret Blake's collection of 67 drawings was highly eclectic spanning from Pisanello's rare study sheet of the Emperor John VIII Paleologus, drawn in 1438, as you see on the left of the screen, to Picasso's fierce embrace of the Minotaur of 1933. And it, the very title of that piece is quite amusing. Um, Margaret Blake was on her deathbed when Harold Joachim brought the drawing to show her, and she said, Oh dear, it's a wonderful drawing. I'd love to buy it for you, but my accountant says I can't spend any more money this year. The next week he came back and looked like Eeyore, and she said, what's the matter? He said, well, the trustees won't approve it because it's called The Rape of the Minotaur. It's a terrible, terrible title. And she said, well, that does it. I just have to give it. <laughs> so but we call it the Embrace of the Minotaur now. However, in 1958, Harold Joachim brought Helen Regenstein into the mix, a recent widow whose husband invented the window envelope. She had a great passion for old master drawings. Indeed, he managed to create a friendly rivalry between collectors, as one lady would try to outmatch or outshine the other one. So, for example, you get on the left Mrs. Blake's wonderful Vato, pur purchased in 1954, and on the right Mrs. Regenstein's first Vato, bought four years later. In contrast to Margaret Day Blake's wide range of subjects, Helen Regenstein honed in on the French and Italian schools with an emphasis on the 18th century. Her collection of 82 works was shown in 1974, in galleries that she had renovated for the museum. Here again, you see the Regenstein drawing is on the right, the Blake Tieplo bought two years later on the left. So this was a wonderful competition for a period of time. One of the most important drawings Helen Regenstein bought was one of her last. Claude Lorrain's magnificent vista of the panorama from the Sasso, created at the end of the artist's life, and belonging to the choicest part of the treasured 17th century album coming from the artist's estate through Prince Odeskalki. It was maintained intact until 1980. Helen Regenstein's children, Joseph Regenstein and Betsy Hartman, continued to build their mother's collection after her death, helping us to acquire an early drawing by Claude from that same part of the intact album. Fortunately, the Margaret Day Blake and Regenstein endowments allow us to continue to build the collections in like fashion to this day. <coughs> Among the selfless philanthropists who helped build the collection in Chicago, Dr. William D. Shorey stands out. His brother was Everett Shorey, a beloved and illustrious chairman of the COA. Bill and his wife Sally were close friends of curator Harold Joachim, who died in 1983. 
Sally herself suffered a debilitating stroke about that time, and Bill thought that in engaging her in the acquisition of works on, of art for the Department of Prints and Drawings might help her rally. He quickly became intrigued himself, and when the Duke of Devonshire, when the Duke of Devonshire decided to uh, fix up the great house at Chatsworth in 1985 by selling off some of his finest prints, Bill took an unusual interest in the sale, encouraging us to go for it, the great monotype of God Creating Adam by John Benedetto Castiglione, thought to be the first work in that medium. Fueled by a family connection to the Devonshire heirs, and I don't know if you knew this, um, their uncle, Kingman Douglas, had married the ninth Duke of Devonshire's widow, Adele Astaire, the sister of Fred Astaire. Bill Shorey and others enabled us to acquire this pivotal image for the collection. And this is really half print, half drawing. It's a remarkable piece. Bill also took delight in building the collection of British drawings, taking my colleague and me to London on the QE2 twice. Here I show Thomas Jones' view of Tivoli in 1777. He also created an endowed fund, which allows us to make purchases in Sally's name as well. But he also bought drawings for himself, uh, with those coming eventually to the Art Institute and some that, as they related to our collections, as, for example, this wonderful Guercino red chalk study for the entombment in our painting collection. But he also um, gave some works to his children and stimulated them to continue to collect, which is important. With the advent of data computerization in the late 1980s and encouraged by an NEA grant, I initiated a drawings documentation project to improve the scholarship on our holdings, evaluate and monitor the growth of the collection. This project brought a number of world-renowned experts in old master drawings to Chicago, 42, I think, we, at last count, and combined with some exceptional drawing exhibitions from Budapest, Windsor Castle, the Tyler's Museum, and the Gabinetto in Rome, created an environment in Chicago that was conducive to collecting old master drawings. A new constellation of collectors gradually formed around the Art Institute, each with a different perspective and plan. First and foremost is a lifelong collector in search of a collection, Dorothy Brout Edinburgh. Here I show Emil Nolde's portrait of the dancer, Mary Wigman, which evokes the youthful beauty reminiscent of one of these collectors, Dorothy Browdy Edinburgh. Not even from Chicago, this wonderful woman, like Helen Regenstein, has believed in forming a collection of major master drawings for a museum. The only child of two conscientious connoisseurs of Asian and decorative arts in Boston, she began collecting drawings early on, as soon as she graduated from Wellesley, and from the beginning showed a creativity and commitment to quality, condition, and documentation that was unusual for a non-professional. <clears throat> Having built a substantial collection of prints, drawings and Asian works. In 1991, she started looking for an appropriate home for it, writing to Douglas Druick, then curator of prints and drawings in Chicago, saying she was interested in finding out about your collection with the idea in mind of perhaps naming your institution in my will. What a treat. She apparently sent two other letters out, which were never responded to, but our director and curator were on the next flight. This began a wonderful association and collaborative effort over the past 22 years, spanning five exhibitions and countless installations in Chicago. An active attendee of all important auctions in London and New York, Dorothy has been a wonderful partner, allowing us to pursue works that enhance the collection, such as Monet's grain stacks, the drawing which is quite unique in Monet's herb, as he drew very little, uh, joins in Chicago six known, um, six 
grain stack paintings, the largest known group of any of his series paintings in any museum in the world. She bought drawings of all periods, um, European and American masters from the 15th century to the mid 20th century, and really went for the great, great drawings, which she called the Rosa Schinken, the big hams. Uh, most importantly, partnering with Dor Dorothy has made it possible for us to participate in auctions more easily than museum structure allows. We can focus our attention on the research, the condition, and the market value without being burdened by the intricacies of museum procedure, requiring <coughs> approval from many, many people and committees with the possibility of letting down as many if unsuccessful. It's just been an extraordinary privilege and honor to work with her as she's built this collection. It's been exciting to see the collection grow in, in individual ways. For example, Degas' early nude of 1858 on the right was purchased at auction in May 1995, and just uh, 18 months later, she was able to acquire the Cezanne early drawing that complements it so well. Just as Dorothy um, built up the French collection, she spearheaded our ambitions to build our collection of 19th century German drawings, buying this rare Schinkel in 1996 and the beguiling Tischbein a few years later. Again, in the spirit of partnership, Dorothy purchased this drawing by Proudhon from the auction of a Chicago estate, returning it to Chicago whence it came. Remarkably, last summer, Dorothy Edinburgh transferred the remaining part of her collection, nearly 800 European and American works on paper, 150 Chinese and Korean ceramics, dozens of Japanese illustrated books, and 400 artist books to the Harry B. and Bessie K. Browdy Memorial Collection at the Art Institute. We did a major show of her collection in 2006 with a catalog, but just took down a few weeks ago another installation of the 100 drawings that she's helped buy for Chicago since 1991. It was a beautiful exhibition. If Dorothy Edinburgh researches her acquisitions with indefatigable vigor like a graduate student in art history. Imagine the careful thought and planning behind a highly focused collection of Italian drawings assembled by Jean Goldman, a PhD recipient in Italian art from the University of Chicago. Both native Chicagoans, Jean and Stephen Goldman, came forward in 1999 with the funds to support a major renovation of the Art Institute's entire print and drawing facilities and indicated their intention to give their collection of drawings to the museum as part of the Jean and Stephen Goldman Princeton Drawing Study Center. A popular teacher and, and lecturer, Jean has focused particularly on Italian Mannerist drawings. An ex exhibition of over 130 of those drawings opened at the Art Institute in 2008 with an international symposium and scholarly catalog written principally by Nicholas Turner, a specialist from the British Museum. Like Dorothy, the Goldmans are faithful attendees of all the old master drawing sales in New York and London, also buying from private dealers as well. And I'll just point out the two catalogs on the left are Edinburgh and Goldman. Amongst the most fully represented artists in their collection is Guercino, a monumental study of the same composition, Guercino's Martyrdom of St. Bartholomew, as a drawing in the Art Institute's collection. So there's been this wonderful uh, symbiotic relationship there. Their collection of close to 200 works today continues to add magnificent and varied artists to an already impressive stable. A true teacher, Jean often remarks what pleasure it brings her to imagine her collection being actively used and appreciate it at the Art Institute one day. One of my favorite memories was sitting beside them at Christie's at, uh, auction of Holcomb Hall works in London in 1991, 
as they bid on this charming little drawing by Domenichino of Putti here, deciding whether to keep on bidding or not, and or haunting the halls of the Salon du Dessin in Paris, where they found this extraordinary drawing of a model for a fan by the Italian mannerist Baccio del Bianco. Then there was their capturing at auction in 1996 of this magnificent Perino del Vaga study for an altarpiece coming from Chatsworth. It's a major work by one of Raphael's closest followers. And they brought, bought one of the great, greatest masterpieces by Agostino Caracci from a local native Hancock neighbor, Mark Brady. Altogether, their first show was a fabulous overview of the Italian drawings of the 16th and 17th centuries. If Jean Goldman brings academic credentials to her collecting, Richard Gray brings a lifetime career as a renowned dealer in modern and contemporary art to the works that he and Mary have assembled over the course of a lifetime. It has been fascinating to watch as they penetrated increasingly back in time so that their collection, while unified by the eye that formed it and renowned for its works on of the 19th and 20th centuries, reaches across seven centuries of works on paper. There's this stunning juxtaposition in this catalog, which you can see after the talk between the uh, very old masterly looking modern drawings and the very modern looking old master drawings. This synonymous portrait attributed to North Italian artist Bonsignori graced the cover of the catalog designed by Massimo Vignelli for their show at the Art Institute in 2010. Many of these old master works have been acquired by the Greys in the past 15 years, ranging from the 16th century figurative work again by Perino del Vaga. Now you see him looking even more like Raphael in his studies of the human form, to the coloristic, supremely iconic Anibale Caracci drawing, which you see now for the Palazzo Farnese. Among the highlights of their promised gifts to us is this unusually vivid drawing of a night by the Venetian artist Giuseppe Porta Salviati. And the youth in the position of the Spinario by Rubens. Like the others, they see their collection as an entity, a work of art that they have created themselves that they hope to keep together in Chicago. We've now touched on the lifelong collector, the scholar collector, the dealer collectors. We come to the confident closet collector, and Cyril Bent. She started buying drawings 30 years ago and also quickly zeroed in on the erudite field of Italian drawings. An autodidact, she bought what and still buys what moves her. Italian drawings, largely figurative and full of emotion, usually telling a story, most appeal to her. And with only some framed in her home. She keeps most of them in a cylinder box in the front hall closet. This allows her for private delectation and direct communion with the unglazed work and makes the public revelation of her collection in the recent show of 2012 that we mounted especially choice. The image chosen for the cover of the catalog, Lilio's Allegory of Confidence, is a perfect emblem of her brave entry into the stormy scholarship of Italian drawings. She has proven to have a marvelous eye and, wittingly or not, has amassed a collection of almost 200 works that gives a fair overview of the development of drawing across Italy from about 1480 to 1800. 
She has bought a wide range of drawings, from the roughest first thought sketches, such as this study by Perino del Vaga, to the most elaborate large Modelo cartoon by Federico Barocci. Now, some of you in the audience may know that this particular collector has been my best chum since seventh grade. So you can imagine the pleasure it's given me to share my favorite area of art history with my dearest friend. You can also imagine her need to exert her independence of me. Imagine my astonishment when, seated right beside her in the Christie's auction room, she anonymously bought this most important Barocci drawing, the real prize of the end of the 20th century, also coming from Chatsworth when it came up for sale in 1999. It's a spectacular piece to be still in private hands. As it happens, Anne, as a member of the Advisory Committee on Prints and Drawings, and later chair following Edward McCormick Blair in that role, Chicago's, uh, Anne has been in, deeply involved with the growth, research, and publication of Chicago's collection of Italian drawings and 10 of the works in her exhibition were purchased for the museum specifically. Included among these are the striking, is the strikingly rare red chalk drawing of St. Benedict by Correggio, which Anne bought for us at auction. Uh, it's for the decoration of San Giovanni Evangelista's cupola in Parma. In addition to the numerous works that she's given over the years, at the time of the exhibition, Anne promised 30 more works to the museum. Anne has woven her drawings collection into her family life with the hope that her children will continue to enjoy and develop it, both at home and for the museum. Do all of her drawings need to come eventually to the museum? Probably not. But it is in a museum like the Art Institute of Chicago that such drawings can find their context really exert their importance and reach the greatest number of people. In Chicago, the personalities of individual collectors are retained and revered, as I hope you can see, and resonate with those from other collections. Just consider how many drawings we have seen tonight by Perino del Baga, by Guercino, by the Caracci. How wonderful to have these works come together, and how much would this striking Tiepolo head add to the collection of Tiepolo drawings established by Margaret Day Blake and Helen Regenstein in the 1950s. Sold recently by another friend, French drawings collector Jeffrey Horvitz of Boston, it suggests the peripatetic life of private delectation that drawings can represent, moving through various collectors' hands. In an era where the market of old master drawings is shrinking, there needs to be a balance between private and public acquisitions to keep the sport alive. Collecting with the museum in mind, David and Celia Hilliard. This past year, we had the privilege of presenting the extraordinary collection assembled by Chicagoans David and Celia Hilliard. A longtime trustee and distinguished patent attorney, David Hilliard has been assiduous in gathering any books or ephemera related to the Art Institute's history, and as vice chair of our committee on prints and drawings, has kept in mind our strengths and weaknesses. Celia Hilliard is a cultural historian and beloved lecturer and author on Chicago history, a member of the now famously endowed Poetry Board. She brings an eye for literature and drama the two of them have been collecting since 1974, initially responding to the museum's needs with such masterworks as this view of Naples of 1781 by Francis Town. Gradually, their taste for the 19th century, particularly works showing unusual artists and angst and energy, such as this slightly sinister late drawing of a dancer by Edgar Duga. Um, this monument or this monumental noir by Odillon Rudon. Both of these being artists that we thought we knew very well, but the Hilliers showed us new <coughs> new views on, on them. The Rudon 
became an epicenter in their collection for other brooding compositions, such as James Ensor's Scandalized Masks of 1883, probably a portrait of Ensor's alcoholic father, a major work by the artist, his first use of masks, and an important broadening of the museum's holdings of non-French 19th century masters. Jan, Jan Turup's ex, exquisite and mysterious composition is also the first work by that Dutch Indonesian symbolist master. Extremely generous over the years and promising many more, the exhibition that we mounted was their first chance to see their collection all together and as with each of the preceding, get a sense of the intelligence and unity of their taste. Well over half of the works in the exhibition had already been given or promised to the Art Institute. It is a concern for many curators that collectors might stop buying, lose interest after their collection has been exhibited and published. This is hardly the case with the Goldmans, who have amassed another 60 drawings since their 2008 show. We will open a sequel on November 1st with the scholarly symposium the day before, heralding many lesser known masters as well as these major drawings by Guercino and culminating in the great romantic finished drawing by Salvatore Rosa, once owned by the director of the Art Institute, John Maxson. At least 55 drawings of the Goldmans have already been identified as promised gifts. It's been a tr tremendous tremendously exhilarating to be able to work with these collectors, bringing drawings into private holdings that define an individual taste and give additional history and luster to the drawing. Some will ultimately revert to the public and help to define the Art Institute's ins institutional taste as well. Our collection has a high visibility, is actively used in exhibitions and teaching and in a very warmly accessible study room, a museum with a school attached like Chicago brings drawings and people together in meaningful ways. Thank you very much.